All right. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for in, in getting through your hangover. I appreciate it. Who's hungover? Oh, come on. <laughs> We're in Sweden. You people. Come on. All right. That's better. <laughs> Good morning. Okay. Uh, I want to thank uh, Stephen for setting everyone's expectations so high that I, can no I can't possibly impress you now. Anything I do, unless I literally create life here, I think, will be a disappointment. So that's cool. That's great. No pressure, right? I can't succeed. All right. Um, thank you for coming out. Uh, my talk is The Five Domains of Play. I'm a creative director at Ubisoft. Um, I have a lot of material to get through, so I'm just going to get to the point. Uh, let's just get started. Um, what am I doing here? The big idea, and um, we carry around as game designers, um, uh, yesterday was a lot of business stuff. This is going to be game design, human motivation, player stuff. We have in our head what I think of as a game design decision model, okay? We, as developers, use all of sorts of information sources to build this model that we then use to make game design decisions to improve our games, right? It's easy enough. And one of the most important sources in my experience um, for these game design decision, decision models are models of player motivation. Why? is your player playing the game? This is the most important question you'll ever need to answer for your game, because if they don't want to play it, they won't play it. So I have spent, I don't know if you know, this, uh, by the way, is a, that's a Babel fish. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you're familiar with the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, anyone Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Oh, yes, my people. Okay, you're all cool now. All right, that's great. <laughs> Phew, all right, I can relax. Just be myself, and I'll say fuck a few times, and it'll be fine. Um, uh, uh, so it translates, for those of you who don't know, the Babel Fish is a universal translator. It translates from any language to any other language. It's a fantastic invention. Um, uh, and I've spent most of my career doing this. Uh, I've spent 15 years doing this, knowing about player motivation models and converting them, translating them into game design decision models uh, for my team. It's one of my specialties. I thought... I was pretty good at this. I was like, oh, hey, you know, this is a couple years ago, and I was like, you know, I've been doing this for a while. I've got an opinion. I'm fairly educated about this. I'm pretty smart. I think I'm in the games industry. And what do you do when you're game in the games industry and you think you're pretty good at what you do? Well, you give a talk. That's what you do. You, g you get up at GDC and you try to sound smart. That's really, that's normally what we do, right? That's the tradition. So I was giving this talk, and I called it the four domains of play. Uh, notice it was, a, it was four. It's changed some since then. Um, uh, and it was an attempt to bring together, uh, you guys are familiar with uh, Richard Bartle, I believe, uh, and Nicole Lazaro's work and a lot of the other work um, that has been done. It was an attempt to sort of bring all that together um, uh, with uh, motivation psychology. Um, and I made an important mistake, or actually uh, a key step in this talk, which is that I showed it to my sister. Uh, that it's her. That's not that's that's my sister, not that one. Um, uh, my sister is a, uh, a PhD psychology um, teacher. She teaches psychology at DigiPen of all things, which is amazing. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um, and I showed it to her. I said, "Here's my talk, sis. This was a week before I was to present this talk at PAX Dev. This was about 18 months ago." I said, "Okay, hey, I'd like to just show you this." And she asked me two questions. She said. You know, the psychology stuff, why are you using all these old models? This Myers-Briggs and 16PF, and all these old, crusty, like, what do you mean, old models? I'm not an old, I'm, okay. <laughs> and then she said, how does the big five fit into this? And I said, the big what? My talk is the four domains of play, sis. What are you doing to me? Why are you, why? <laughs> Over the course of a single lunch, uh, she simply <laughs> destroyed my entire presentation. Um, literally wrecked the whole thing. Um, and I had a week to go. I had a week. I had, was signed up. I was printed in the, in the, in the, on the posters and stuff. It was like I was presenting, man. And so I had to go and give the talk. <laughs> so I spent the next... I didn't sleep much. I, I drank a lot of coffee. And I learned about a thing called the Big Five. Um, now, 
if you're like me, um, you had been, I have, you have never heard of the Big Five. <laughs> um, I was like, the Big What? Turns out, uh, in the last 20 years, the Big Five, uh, it's, a, it's a model of human motivation that is, it emerged around 1990, mid-90s is where it really became popular. It has since come to kind of dominate the world of academic um, study on um, human, mo um, human, human motivation and personality. And it's very different from the other models uh, that are out there uh, for a series of important reasons. Um, first is a lot of the models that you may be familiar with, the personality tests that you may have taken, they're developed by usually dozens of researchers. Often there's one person who's behind it and then that researcher sort of gets other people together and then they proceed. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of researchers working on the Big Five uh, around the world right now. It started in Denmark, um, and it kind of spread around from there. It's international. It's been translated, I think, into 17 languages, proven to work consistently across all of those languages. It's a remarkable thing. Most other models, um, usually uh, all the models that you talk about, they're copyrighted. I didn't know this, and it really bugs me, <laughs> OK? Because this is supposed to be science. You don't copyright science. <laughs> That's not cool, but they do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right? But they do. Um, Myers-Briggs uh, or any of these other personality tests that you're familiar with, you can't have the core data, and you can't have their information that they got their studies from. It's copyrighted. And if you want to use their stuff, you have to pay them a very significant fee. Big Five, on the other hand, is public domain. It was forced into the public domain uh, by a guy named uh, Goldman around 1999, in a really cool way. Uh, it's pretty amazing. It's still changing. Um, other models have several studies that are done. There's lots of data that's behind it. But because it's closed, it's not really, uh, um, uh, yeah, I don't know how else to describe it. Um, when I started to get information from my, I asked my sister, I was like, can I get some papers from her? You know, can I, can I get some of the data? I was like, she's like, well, there's a lot of data for it. I'm like, what do you mean data? I'm telling you, you, you stick your toe in the river of data, of white papers that is being written about this thing, it'll tear it right off. There are people, they, they have um, correlative studies that explain the differences in the big five across cultures, gender, age, how it changes as you get older, um, uh, different cultural groups inside each country. They're looking at genetic correlations now. They've found that some of these factors are actually passed from parent to child. It's like nothing you have ever thought seen if you think about personality. If you still think about um, motivation psychology as sort of like astrology plus, yeah, it's not like that anymore. Okay? <laughs> it's changed. So eventually I had to say, fine, I get it, great, stop. Thank you, great. I give up. Uh, I take your word for it. It's cool. And I went with it. So instead, now, this is what I'm doing. So this talk is this. The talk is the big five, and I'm trying to convert it into game design. I'm trying to convert it into a thing I call the five domains of play. So that's the background. That's why I'm here. I give that to give you guys some perspective. I've been doing this for 18 months. This has not been my life study. <laughs> I'm not a world expert on this. Um, and so I keep expecting to run into someone who knows this stuff a lot better than me. Um, and if that person is in this room, I would love to talk to you. Um, so uh, what is it, the big five? I'm gonna give you, a, as, I'm gonna give you the, the, the condensed course on the big five. I'm gonna try and teach you the big five as quickly as I can. So here they are, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, which conveniently spells ocean, which means nothing, but is convenient to remember. That's literally all that means. So these are the five categories. These are five domains of human personality slash motivation. I've been challenged on whether I should use the word motivation, and if you're the kind of person that wants to twiddle about that, I'll, be, I'll happily argue with you about it later. <laughs> it doesn't really matter for our purposes. <laughs> if you're someone who, who is motivated or has that personality type, it's the same for game developers. These are the five categories. Okay, what is important, I'm gonna go through each of these, but what's important to understand is that in the big five, uh, if you, I don't know if you can see the big bell-shaped curve behind uh, in the back there. Um, each of these is a spectrum. And what's remarkable about the Big Five, and different from all the um, science that has come before, is that it's defined at the beginning as being a standard distribution across the human population. That's really cool. It's really useful. 
means we have a baseline, <laughs> which, is, which is not present in most of the other systems. Okay, so openness, uh, openness on one side, closeness on the other, standard distribution across, across humanity for the rest of them, same for conscientiousness, unconscious, extroversion, introversion, agreeableness, disagreeableness, <laughs> my favorite, <laughs> nice asshole. Uh, <laughs> it's not actually true, but it's close. Uh, okay, uh, and then neuroticism and stability. And actually, I'm going to chew some ice into the speaker now. <laughs> um, sorry. Actually, I want to hit this point again. Because this was, this was and has been one of the most important things I have learned from this um, effort so far. <laughs> this, this curve, this is how population works. And I knew this, but about six months into studying this, I suddenly realized that I had never seen it before in my design conversations. If you're like me, in game production and game development, when we start talking about player types and player motivation and player archetypes, inevitably someone pulls out this chart. Okay? Now, <laughs> this chart, and then they fill it in with these words or something like them. Now, this came at the beginning from a very clever man named Richard Bartle, who I believe has been here and spoken, right? <laughs> and it is not wrong. It is, in fact, been quite useful. It was a major breakthrough in our understanding of, of human motivation and psychology. But there's an interesting quirk that has appeared because, I believe, of the way we draw this chart. While it is true that there are these four categories of motivation, if you're in the game development business, people will get up on the whiteboard and they'll draw this and then they'll start to talk about it as if it were the following thing. I think of this as the thermometer model of game design. The way that it works is you stick the thermometer in your game and you measure its achievementness. If your game has a lot of achievement stuff in it, lots of hard difficulty, you know, and lots of things to collect and finish and completable, all of that, right? Then whoop, boom, and great, that's cool. Lots of money, right? The achievers are going to buy your game. Great. But if not, well, not so much. You know, that's actually, we don't really like that. Because if, if, if the achievement level is zero, that doesn't mean anything, really. It's sort of null, Right? Well, that's not how humans work. There's no null motivation. So this led me to the following question, which literally blew my mind. What is the opposite of an achievement player? 15 years of game design, it never even, never even occurred to me to ask this question. <laughs> and that freaked me out a little bit. And you know what? I haven't met very many people who have asked this question at all. Turns out, a big five provides us a way to answer this question. On the one side the, is the concept of an achievement player. The other side, as it turns out, is a contentment player. This is someone who doesn't give a shit about your external measures, who doesn't want to collect all of your gamer points, is perfectly happy, in fact, to just skip all that and get to the content. And this is a positive player motivation. Pay, players will pay for this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ernest is going, yes, <laughs> this is me. <laughs> okay? There's money on both sides of this curve, as Zynga has shown us. <laughs> okay? <laughs> People are willing to skip through all that crap just to get through it, right? I'm over here, by the way. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of us on this side in the game development, which I think is part of why it never occurred to us to make an ar archetype of this side. Okay, I've made that point heavily enough. I'm going to come back to it many times, though. If you walk away from this talk with only this idea, that will be fine. <laughs> okay? This is the big one. This is what I want to put in your head because it has radically changed the way that I think about um, my players. Because it applies not just to achievement, it applies to ev almost everything. Except for a few key things like mastery and uh, that sort of stuff. Okay, so let's do it. Uh, let's just do them. Let's just do, here's the course, the big five in five minutes. Um, openness to experience. Um, <laughs> openness uh, distinguishes imaginative, creative uh, motivations, not people, motivations, <laughs> from down-to-earth 
conventional ones. Uh, a high scoring uh, openness to experience is Alice from Alice in Wonderland. Alice, who is perfectly happy to follow a rabbit down to wherever the hell, who knows? Well, Ra Alice, who is perfectly happy to drink whatever, eat whatever, sure, yeah, love it. Bum be dum be dum, right? Alice, uh, openness, open to experience, I believe. <laughs> All kinds of experiences. I'll take that mushroom. <laughs> mm, I like that. <laughs> A low score in openness to experience is Sam Weiss-Gamgee. Sam, who went on what many have described as the greatest adventure of, uh, in history ever, you know, in literature, absolutely saved the, the entire world, if not the universe, and at the end of the entire thing, really through the entire thing, he just wanted to go home. Can I just go home to my garden? That would be great. Can we just stop all of this? I didn't want to go to Mordor. <laughs> so that's Sam. Hi, low. Conscientiousness. Conscientiousness deals with the way that we control our impulses. Okay? So it's how we constrain ourselves. It's about self-control, discipline, um, structure, these kinds of ideas. A high degree of conscientiousness is Hermione Granger. Okay? Hermione, who imagine sometimes what it would be like to get a B, <laughs> fail at something, not be naturally good at the things that she tries to accomplish. Hermione, who keeps all of her things just so. Hermione, who is the person you always turn to when you need to get something done? When Harry finally decides that it's time to get something done, who does he turn to? He turns to Hermione. A low score <laughs> in conscientiousness is... Uh, Jeff Lebowski, the dude whose greatest ambition in life is to bowl. That's about it. Jeff, who can turn a trip to, trip to uh, the store into a disaster, who loses his keys on, um, in literally every scene. Uh, that's low conscientiousness. Okay, extroversion. Extroversion deals with our desire to seek out stimulation, um, both in terms of like, yahoo, explosions, and... Uh, in terms of the, the company of other people. Those turn out to be the same sort of thing. A high extroversion is, yeah, baby, <laughs> um, is Mr. Pa Mr. Austin Powers. Mr. Austin Powers, who basically has never been seen alone, as far as I know. Um, he's in every scene, unless he's literally being tortured, um, uh, who is constant and is always up for a party and is always there for excitement, is bigger, louder than life, always a leader of the pack. A low extroversion is our poor dear friend, Edward, um, who is perfectly happy to do whatever you want. Yes, yes, it's fine. I'll do whatever you want. Please just go away. Please just leave me alone in my castle and I'll be perfectly happy, okay? Low, high. Extroversion. Agreeableness. Agreeableness. Uh, agreeableness deals with our opinions and, and our motivations around social harmony, getting along with other people. Um, a high... A degree of agreeableness uh, is uh, Hagrid, uh, who, I mean, honestly, uh, he's a, like a pet. <laughs> I want to bring him home. He's, he's, you go and cute, he's cute and cuddly, and he, he couldn't dream of telling you a lie, or, right, he feels terrible when he hurts your feelings, and he's always there, but he's always, you know, willing to, a, a um, low agreeableness, call me snake. I don't know if you guys know who this is. Uh, you guys know who this is, I hope. Okay, <laughs> it's, um, but the young'uns might not. Um, a snake who, in the film uh, Escape from New York, in order to get Snake to care about the life of the President of the United States, he had to have explosives injected in his neck <laughs> that would blow up if the President died. That was, and then he's like, fine. <sighs> I'll care. Jeez, but call me Snake. <sighs> he's got a big snake tattoo. He's, he's into himself. He really is. Um, okay. Neuroticism. Neuroticism is uh, one of the, uh, in the big five, it's sort of the controversial one. It's the one that has the most questions surrounding it, and that reinforced itself in my work. But neuroticism reflects, and this is what's unique in the big five, it reflects in a tendency to experience purely negative emotions. Positive emotions are all in the other categories. 
the big five makes the statement, and it turns out to be true so far, is that your tendency to experience negative emotions is different, in a different spectrum than, than positive emotions. You can be someone who has very high highs without having any lows, that, or, or the other way, or have middles, or they can be anywhere in between. A high neuroticism would be not the man, Woody Allen, but the character, Woody Allen, that he plays, for whom every shadow is filled with, filled with fear, every comment is an insult, uh, everything that goes wrong causes him to lose his shit, uh, every, everything, he simply is not capable of responding positively to anything that occurs uh, in his life. A low neuroticism would be Obi-Wan Kenobi, who greets his death like this. Bring it. Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm not going to start with the Star Wars quotes. I could, but I won't. Okay. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. That's the big five. Okay? That's the quickest way I've found <laughs> to get this. It's a huge amount of information. I hope you're absor absorbing it. Okay. So that's cool and everything. How does this apply to game design? Um, so, as you know, when you're doing science, which kind of turned into what this was, <laughs> um, you have to start with something called, and I, this was new for me because I'm a game developer, I'm an entertainer, um, a, an hypothesis. I have to come up with a hypothesis. What is our hypothesis? The hypothesis in every case uh, for um, this kind of applying personality model to game design takes the following form. Does Hermione like Dark Souls, question mark? Because she seems like she's really, if she's, if she's a, a conscientiousness and control and self-control, maybe she likes games that are challenging, that are difficult, that are going to push her to the limit, and who knows. This is where I started. Does, does Hermione like, uh, like Dark Souls? Ish. Um, and all of the other characters as well. Would they like games that are in the, that, how do those, how do those match up? This is what we're trying to do. Okay, so how do we do this? Why do we do research? <laughs> what a weird concept. Uh, I'm in the private sector. Uh, um, it's very strange. This is all new to me. I learned all this from my sister. She explained it to me. She's like, okay, there's two kinds. You can do quantitative research where you get lots and lots of people together um, and then do a big test of the same thing. I'm like, I don't have lots and lots of people. <laughs> uh, maybe I can get them later, but first, um, and I don't really know what I'm doing. So at the beginning, you do a thing called, called qualitative research. Qualitative research is where you take a test and then you interview people, basically. You do a smaller set and you dig much, 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 much deeper. The way that it works is this. There's a test, as it turns out. Here's the link. It's in the, uh, don't write that down. Don't, <laughs> um, uh, but it's, it's in the slides. There's a test online for this. And it's free, which is one of the things that's great about the big five. You can pay if you want to. You can pay lots of companies hundreds of dollars for this. Um, but there's a test. It'll just give you, it takes, it's 300 questions. It takes about five minutes to answer. It's really simple. It's stuff like, do you like to keep your desk neat? When you go to parties, do you feel rejuvenated? That kind of stuff. Really simple, you know, one to five. All right, easy enough. Well, there's this test. So what I've been doing is I've been giving people the test, and then I've been spending two hours with them, asking them about their game uh, experience. <laughs> hey, just sit down and la la, do you like this? And do you play StarCraft? And do you play rogues? Oh, you play rogues? Yeah, get out. Freaking rogues. Um, <laughs> manage your aggro. Manage your aggro. Um, I know you're out there. Okay, uh, this, as it turns out, is called qualitative research. I found out when I was doing it. I had no idea. I just was just curious how people would respond to the test. Turns out this is, this is actually what people in academic circles call qualitative research. Yay. So I'm going to skip to the end uh, and give you the conclusion, and then we're going to walk through how I got there, and that's going to get really boring, so hang in there. But at the end, no, no, no necessarily surprise. Hey, woohoo! <laughs> Hermione loved Dark Souls. Yeah, we were right, I think. Um, so far, anyway, the data is not complete, but I have enough data now. I've done enough interviews to start to say it looks like there are some interesting trends, enough that um, we're constructing, and I have now a survey that can be used for a quantitative study that I'm attempting to initiate next. This is the next step. Um, the conclusions are a little, I can go a little more, little more deeper than that, though. Let's just give you an idea of what we actually found um, along the way. Um, 
uh, it, we're talking about openness. Alice, what kind of games does Alice like? Turns out Alice likes Minecraft. Okay? <laughs> Alice likes, likes games with, where every time you click new game, it's literally a new game. It's, it's always some new space to explore. There are no rules. You can go wherever you want to. You can do every, every new thing is a new shiny. You can go anywhere and anywhere. And it's beautiful, big vistas, open spaces, this sort of thing. Sam, as it turns out, is a big fan of Madden. Or maybe FIFA. Um, uh, it's the same game every year, okay? It's a game that is based on a game that, is ex that already exists. It's literally a photocopy of reality. Uh, there's not much invention going on there, right? Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, uh, so it's, it's predictable. It's by the book. Okay, so when we're talking about video games then, there's a tendency to say, okay, what's the aspect of the game that we're talking about here? I call this novelty, okay? Novelty is how much new is the game bringing to me? High scorers want high novelty, low scorers want low novelty in their game. Openness, imaginative experiences. Okay. Conscientiousness, what kind of game does Hermione like? Well, she likes Dark Souls. Or games like Splinter Cell, games with an enormous amount of challenge, games that require an enormous amount of personal restraint. Or games like World of Warcraft, where you have to grind forever. Awesome, love it. Jeff Lebowski, as it turns out, just wants to play Lego Star Wars. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Where you can just drop in any time. There's no real structure. You really can't lose. You can't. It's, this, it's out of the game. They didn't even implement a game over or you fail screen. doesn't exist in Lego Star Wars. You, know, you can just play however the hell you want to. So we call this challenge. Um, not, again, the, the categories here aren't the relevant point, and I've been giving this talk. They're useful for me in terms of um, communicating the point, but it's not like we need, we're going to be using these uh, names, these categories. The archetypes are what's important for us. Austin Powers, uh, he's a weird case. There are a lot of games that he likes, but I think really this is the one that Austin wants to play the most. Uh, Just Dance is probably the best ex extrovert game of all time. Uh, it's really not something you play alone very often unless you're exercising. Uh, uh, and it's an ultimate party game. No, I don't think it's possible to play Just Dance without smiling. I don't think it's been done. I don't think it's actually, unless you're like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Edward, however, and you can probably see this one coming, is like, yeah. Flower. <laughs> right? Low stimulation, solo experience, uh, you're on your own, so these sorts of things. Stimulation. This category, this domain of play is called stimulation. The, the aspect of the game that, that, that is being presented here that we're just, if we were to give the game the personality test, we would be talking about stimulation. Um, the social um, stimulation level. Agreeableness. <laughs> uh, Hagrid, as it turns out, uh, is a big fan of Little Big Planet. Okay? A game where you know, you're, it's all built around being nice to each other, unless you whack each other into the thing. But then you, know, you're, you come right back. It's all about sharing and community. It's funny. It's happy. It's, we're all being sort of nice to each other. Uh, Snake, however, clearly, I think, is, you know, I think he plays Ryu. He really is. He's all about the comp competitive level. Um, uh, and uh, we call this, uh, this, this domain is called Harmony. This is about how are we, how, how, how are we going to get along um, in the world together. Um, now, I want to make sure that, that, that it's clear here. What I'm talking about is I have been giving people the test. People who score like Snake play games like Street Fighter. People who score like Hagrid play games like Little Big Planet. And it's actually down to a, me um, uh, a mechanical level, which I'm going to share with you. Uh, that's the next section of the, of the talk. But that's pretty profound, <laughs> I found. It's something we've already th always talked about, and it's something that I had always imagined was true. And I think if you're a gamer or you're working in the industry, we always kind of assume that it's true. To me, it was a little bit different when I suddenly discovered that there was a statistical correlation um, between these things. It's a new world, and I'm really excited about having stumbled onto this. Um, so, ah! Neuroticism, oh, rules and player player action. Neuroticism, by the way, so since uh, I got the happy part out of the way, neuroticism is fucked. Um, <laughs> it doesn't work at all. You would think, if you follow the logic, remember, neuroticism is about negative emotion, if you follow the logic, it makes sense that um, someone, someone who, is, who is neurotic, who is 
positively motivated. This is what's very strange about neuroticism as a score. People with a high neuroticism score want to feel fear. They want to be addicted to things. They want to, they have this desire to go and be that way. I don't know if you guys, if, any of, if there is anyone who is uh, an addictive type personality, but oftentimes when you see, like before World of Warcraft came out, I have a very high addictiveness score. Um, uh, before World of Warcraft came out, I was like, that's going to ruin my life. Awesome. That's what I'm talking about. You see Resident Evil, you go, oh, that's going to scare the shit out of me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's that. You have this desire to go and experience these negative emotions, maybe in a positive context. So you would think that someone like um, uh, Mr. Woody Allen as a character might want to play a game like Modern Warfare where he can be insulted and, you know, lose constantly, struggle constantly, be filled with all these constant things. And you would think that maybe someone like uh, old Obi-Wan would want to play something like Peggle where it's just, la, la, it's meditation. I click once and lo, explosions happen. Unfortunately, it turns out that the truth in my, in my studies is that, I, and I would call this threat, deals with um, the, the idea to trigger negative emotions. Unfortunately, my studies have demonstrated that he likes Resident, Resident Evil 4, and so does he. Gah! All the other categories work fine. <laughs> okay? But I literally had... Two cases with extremes on both sides who were both listed Resident Evil 4 as their top three game. And I'm like, fuck! Uh, okay. So threat, neuroticism is, is, a, is a disaster right now and it doesn't correlate. Um, I think I know why, but that doesn't really help. It still doesn't correlate. <laughs> okay, so the five domains of play. Novelty, challenge, stimulation, harmony, and threat. I think. Maybe, I hope. So that's what I found. That's the that's the that's the sort of the that's the whole thing. Great, done, right? That's it. There's an important question we have to answer, though, um, uh, if we're going to go back past just me trying to sound smart, and that's this one. This is a really big question. Uh, uh, or stated another way, uh, do we really just need Vandenberg's taxonomy? <laughs> <laughs> we don't. We have plenty of taxonomies. They work fine. Uh, and I'm, it was not my desire to go up and give a talk that was just another one of those. So why are we here? The reason we're here is because the Big Five has in it another layer that I want to show you. Um, and that is profound. But uh, it's, it's kind of intense. <laughs> So, so, this is it. This is your last chance. You take the blue pill. You wake up. You forget this ever happened. You stay happy. You take the red pill. It's going to get kind of boring and a little confusing, and there's a lot of data in here, so hang on. But you've been warned. So if you fall asleep, it's your fault. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> Maybe. I've, actually, it doesn't work that way, but I would like it to work that way. Okay. Facets. Here's why I'm actually standing up here, because up until this point, when I was reading the Big Five, I was like, yeah, okay, this sounds like Bartle a lot, actually. <laughs> it's a lot like that, maybe a different version of that. Um, okay, well, turns out there's a lot more science underneath it. Facets. The truth about each of these domains is that if we talk about a concept like openness to experience, what that actually means underneath the hood, if you lift, lift up the hood and look at the wires, Openness to experience is actually a combination of six distinct facets of motivation. The score that you're given for openness to experience is something like a weighted average in six different very specific motivations. And if you're following along, you can see that this talk could turn into a six-hour lecture. <laughs> if, if I was feeling like if you were willing to sign up. <laughs> but we're not going to do that, right? But there are 30 facets. There are 30 of these. And each of them are uh, at a level of granularity that I think that I have discovered correlate directly to um, motivation, uh, to mechanic, mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics, specific ones. And I'm going to show you an example, examples of those. 
So when you get your scores back, this is what you actually get. This is what you actually get when you get your scores. Those are, yeah, it's something like that. You get these 30 different pieces. So I'm going to break this down. I'm going to do one. <laughs> I'm going to do openness to experience in detail, okay? So that you can get a feel for how this works. The rest are going to be in the slides. We're going to blow through them. You're going to see a bunch of words that come up and, ah, <laughs> Um, I don't expect you to read them. They're just in the deck so that you can download it if you're interested, right? But a lot of this information is online. Um, okay, so let's do it. Op openness to experience. The first facet. First facet of openness to experience is called imagination, okay? On the one side, we have imagination. On the other side, we have a thing called fact orientation. People with a high score in imagination like their inner world, their inner imagined world, better than the real world. And that's it. That's the whole thing. It's not deeper than that. That's the entire facet. People with a low score like the real world better than the imagined inner world that they have. Okay? They like the facts of the matter. They like the real existence. And again, that's it. It's not more complex than that. It doesn't require further interpretation. Hmm, I said to myself, that sounds a lot like a debate that I have constantly every goddamn day with my producers about the difference between fantasy and realism. Turns out, it does correlate. <laughs> Second facet, artistic interests. Artistic interests on the one hand, practical interests on the other. High scores and artistic interests like beauty. They are touched deeply by things that are beautiful. Um, uh, visually, visual beauty. This is not music. It's different. Um, uh, uh, people who with a low score appreciate the practical nature of an object. They can see beauty, but they're affected by whether or not it's functional. Again, that's the whole thing. It doesn't go deeper than that. Third, emotionality. People with a high score in emotionality have a high degree of access a high degree of knowledge about how they feel. And so they tend to express it more, right? People with, and not necessarily, they don't necessarily have more emotions than other people, they just are more aware of them. People with a low score, uh, by the way, quick survey, uh, old Spock? Pretty good, pretty good, new Spock. Ha, 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 all right. It's the first time old Spock won. That's all, all right. Right on. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, he's great. He's great. We got to give it up for him, right? He's, he's awesome. Um, people with a low score have less information about how they feel. They're not necessarily aware of their emotions. Not that they don't have them. They just don't express them very much. Like Spock. Um, fourth facet, adventurousness. People with a high degree of adventurousness want to know what's over the next hill. They want to know what's inside the box. They want to know what's hidden in your drawers. <laughs> they want to they wanna know. They want to go and see what's over the next hill. They want to they explore. They want to go and they, they are intrigued and curious. People with a low score in adventurousness want their world to be predictable. Okay? They, want, they want a routine. They want things to go the way they want to be. They want, want things to kind of go in the way that they normally do. And these directly oppose each other. Fifth, intellect. Intellect, this is not intelligence. This is a style of thinking. People with a high score in intellect like puzzles. Okay? They find the act of solving a problem in their head satisfying. So if I say 2 plus 2 equals, and if in solving that, you were like, yep, cool, <laughs> right? Then, you have, then that would be a higher score. A lower score is like, yeah, okay, you made me solve that, but why? <laughs> they need puzzles to relate to the real world to be interested. They're more interested in people and things. Fifth and last, um, liberalism. Liberalism, people with a high score, want to uh, progress the world, right? They want to see the world move forward from where it is. They want to advance society and civilization. And people with a low score uh, want to see things uh, stay the way they are or return uh, to the past. They're more interested in the past than they are in the future. And this does tend to correlate uh, with your political opinion. 
which is interesting. Um, okay. So that's it. Fact orientation, imagination. Uh, fact, uh, imagination, artistic interest, emotionality, adventurous, adventurousness, intellect, liberalism. Okay. These are the six facets of openness to experience. And these are my scores <laughs> okay. in openness to experience. Um, this is what you get. And I can tell you that it's true. It's pretty true. I like new things. I like my fan. I've been playing, playing Dungeons & Dungeons Dragons since I was eight. Uh, so I love all this stuff. It's absolutely true. And I love new things. I love all new things. I want them to come. But they better come on a goddamn routine. I want them on a schedule. I want to know. My wife is here. She can go and she say, yes, yes, it's true. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no surprises with my new things, thank you. I want to, it's like, aha, that's why I love Zelda. Because it's like, ah, it's right there in the box is where the new thing is. Good. <laughs> Communicate to me clearly about where the new thing is. <laughs> Fog of war, very useful. I know where all the new stuff is, so I can go explore it. So that just to give you a feel for the way that these work, right? Because they do work. They're pretty interesting. Again, this is not that hard, though. This is not I me mean, not not hard. This is not that um, magical. The test is basically a series of questions where they ask you, "Do you like new things?" and "Do you like to be surprised?" And I'm like, "Yes" and "No." And then they give me the score back, and he says, "Well, it turns out you like new things, and you don't like to be surprised." It's not voodoo, okay? It's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty simple, actually. <laughs> um, it's just a matter of finding the right things. That's the, that's the trick. Okay, so now I'm going to show you what I did. Show you what I, the way that we discovered these correlations. Remember I told you that, Herm, that um, Hermione, I told you that Alice likes uh, Minecraft, and I told you that Sam likes um, uh, Madden or FIFA. Okay, well, why? How did I come to that conclusion? Here's how I did it. So I just dropped all the words down, boop, because now they don't matter. And I'm going to show you some of the um, statistical, some of the correlations between what we do. High scores in imagination play fantasy games. <laughs> they like science fiction. They like, they like worlds that are not like this world. Players, um, players with a low score consistently report that they want the world to be... <laughs> like the real world. In fact, somewhere around 40% in the middle there is where people start going, when I say, what kind of games do you like? People start going, yeah, games with the elves and the, yeah, don't get that. <laughs> they, get, they get really like, ugh, elves and dwarves, ick. Right, right around, right around there. <laughs> right? There's a middle zone where people sort of don't care. People with a middle score kind of like are like, what's the big deal? Why do people get so worked up, right? But people up here are like, yes, please, elves and goblins, other world. People down here are like, right here, simulation. Yes, I'll take my simulation. Thank you very much. These guys like um, uh, uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator and Train Simulation. Simulation Tycoon. It's weird. <laughs> um, artistry, as you would expect. Um, artistry, uh, people with a high score appreciate the beauty in the game. They will often buy a game based on its looks. They, they're the ones who are seeking graphics. <laughs> people with a low score, I have a, an example later on. Um, I'll show that story later. People with a low score can appreciate, can appreciate the beauty of a game, but generally appreciate it based on how hard it was to make. Okay? Not how affecting it is. <laughs> I find, find that was fascinating. Um, emotionality, this correlates directly to a preference for or against melodrama. Oh, you must pay the rent. I can't pay the rent. You must pay the rent. I can't pay the rent. It's over here. <laughs> okay. Down here, it's kind of like, meh, but God, yeah, gosh, pay the rent. God. Okay. Melodrama in our games. Um, adventurousness. People with a high score um, in adventurousness, I ask the question this way in the test. I say, if I was going to give you a choice between exploring over the next hill or building your base up first, which would you choose? People with a high adventurousness score are like, fuck the base, I'm going to go look over the hill. People with a, a low score, they want to think, what I'm starting to think of as cultivation. They want to build up their base 
until it's like rocking, ready to go, and then sort of sneak out and peek over the next hill. <laughs> Which is ironically exactly how I do it. Um, <laughs> it's precisely the way that I play. Um, uh, intellect has a direct correlation to a preference for puzzles. People with a high score play games like Tetris, they play games like um, Picross, they play, the people with a high score play Sudoku for fun. Yeah? Sudoku for fun? Who mastered Sudoku? Yeah, I did, yeah. You feel bad, right, when you break it? You're like, oh, now I can beat all of them. Damn. People with a low score are like, um, it's okay if you have a puzzle, but it needs to be well justified in the setting. It needs to make sense. It can't be too stupidly complex, right? Um, I, I need to get through it. I need to be able to move on. They won't say, I haven't found anyone that will say, no, fuck you in your puzzles. That, that doesn't exist. But I've, I've, I've found a lot of people that are like, it needs to be built into the world and don't do it more than once or twice, right? And this one correlates with nothing at all, as far as I can tell. <laughs> Um, in fact, I ha th one of the strange um, things that's come out of this uh, research um, is that I, it's starting to appear to me that games are apolitical, um, which is very frustrating. I would like to have an answer to this question. Okay, again, these are my scores. Um, talk about a couple of other scores to give you a better idea of what we're talking about here. This guy, this guy, Mr. Mr. Zero in artistry. He told me, this, told me that when he played Skyrim, you guys played Skyrim, yeah? You seen this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's set here. I mean, you should freaking play, right? Uh, I don't know if you know that, but uh, they kind of stole your country. Um, or at least the peninsula, anyway. Um, uh, uh, he said, we climbed up to the very tallest mountain and looked out across the vast landscape and said, wow, they sure did a great job with their LOD system. That's a lot of work. Okay, on to the next thing, right? I'm like, <laughs> did you happen to notice that it was gorgeous? I, uh, um, and furthermore, he also, this is the guy who was like, please get your melodrama out of my freaking game. Please keep your cinematics out of my game. Um, uh, this guy, I included this one as an example because he is right in the middle. And this is the guy who, these guys ex experience, ex um, express literally no opinion about fantasy versus um, realism, artistry or not. He says, yeah, I like it when it's good. I hate it when it's bad. I like good fantasy. I like bad, I hate bad fantasy. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Love good realism, hate bad realism, right? But, but anime characters who cry too much need to stay out of my freaking games. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's like that. It's like that. Okay? So, hopefully, by now, I've given you kind of an idea of why I'm enthusiastic about this research. <laughs> okay? Because for the first time, um, in my experience anyway, I'm talking to people and I can look at their scores and predict what kinds of games they want to play. Not necessarily which game they'll play, but on a mechanical level, I can say it's going to be one of these. It's going to be around this. And the first time I did that, the first time I sat down and made a men mental note, I was like, okay, I think this person is a StarCraft II player. Probably, they probably like StarCraft II multiplayer. She sat down and said, yeah, I play StarCraft II multiplayer. I was like, this is really creepy. <laughs> I need to stop. Witchcraft, witchcraft, right? I need to like, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, witchcraft. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. I'm a bad man. Um, okay, so uh, there are four more of these. Conscientiousness has all of these things. Yes, it's called achievement striving. And yes, <laughs> achievement striving correlates with, what do you know, achievements. Hey, uh, it totally works. Uh, Self-discipline and grinding. These are the ones for conscientiousness. Remember, this is the one we were talking about with Hermione and the dude. This person... One of my favorite, uh, favorite topics, this person plays one or two games a year because she tells me she uh, refuses to not finish. And when she says finish, it's done. And we're talking about Kingdom Hearts. Has anyone here finished 100% Kingdom Hearts? Yeah, you're not proud of it, are you? 
You, know? <laughs> you, know? you feel kind of dirty inside, right? You're like, oh, oh God, right? It's like that. Uh, this person uh, told me, so I asked him about grinding, procrastination. This is the self-discipline score. Self-discipline is sorry, how, how willing are you to, to uh, force yourself to do work. This person tells me that he dreads, he plays like hundreds of games a year, he dreads the moment where the game is going to ask him to grind. Because the moment, he, the moment the game asks him to grind, it's when he quits and changes games. <laughs> Simply refuses to play. <laughs> I asked him about his opinion about achievements, and he said when the achievements were invented, when Microsoft had put them out, right, um, he went on the boards, on the, on, the, on, the, on the forums, and wrote, you know, walls of text about how they were going to destroy gaming. Right? Again, I'm like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> I like these things. Extroversion, again, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but remember, extroversion is about um, social interaction, this sort of thing. It correlates with these sorts of things. Again, I'm just putting this in the slides for your own reference. Um, uh, this person uh, literally plays games. Um, most, his most satisfying experiences are, come in two categories, story-based games that are all about characters, or multiplayer experiences where he's playing cooperatively with other people, doesn't play other kinds of games. Right, that's it. Um, uh, I'm gonna, it, it, I, have more, I have more stories about this. I'm going to skip this one and keep moving because I've been, I've been talking and I only have 10 minutes left. I want get to the, get to the conclusion. Um, agreeableness, same sort of thing. Uh, uh, this, one, this, is one, this one's fascinating. He had freaking rogues. You're in there. Altruism. Altruism is uh, about do you find uh, the act of helping someone else uh, satisfying, whether or not you get a reward for it, right? Um, so that's, and it directly correlates to playing healers. Um, and over here, you're like, oh, no, I don't give a shit about other people. Uh, I'd happily just, yeah, I know you're out there. Paladin. Come on, let's go. <laughs> PvP right now. Um, uh, I also discovered uh, um, uh, something that was uh, that Daniel in his talk pointed out about in his conversation about guild PvP being a really big deal. Um, uh, I want to reinforce that idea. You see this one competition and accommodation. On the one hand, of competitive, um, I've discovered that there isn't, as far as I can tell, such a thing as PvP and PvE. In this category, it seems to break down to the idea of people with a high score in competition want to be me against everyone else so that I can win, right? And the other side of the spectrum is us versus everyone else so that we can win. So I'm calling this me VP and us VP. <laughs> okay, <laughs> another distinction there. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> She, she said, when she sent me her test score, she said, oh my God, I should have lied. I'm a monster. <laughs> StarCraft II multiplayer, in case you were curious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Exclusively. <laughs> um, some other ones. Neuroticism, though, um, doesn't correlate at all. But here are the general ideas that they seem to correlate to. Addiction, there's a thousand, there's all of our money is right there in that one. That's where the money comes from in this video game industry. But uh, um, here's the thing. This guy likes Resident Evil 4, and this guy likes Resident Evil 4. Kill me now. Uh, my theory was going so well, uh, and then it just fell apart. Um, fortunately, I'm not the only one who has problems with neuroticism. Uh, Nick, Nick Yee, uh, who's a um, uh, professor... Uh, did a, at, I forget the name of his university, he did a correlative study with World of Warcraft and the Big Five. As far as I know, the only other game work that's been done on this, um, and had the same problem. All the other four, all those four categories, what he did is he got of like 1,400 World of Warcraft players' game data, their achievements, all their characters, how long they play, their habits, all that stuff, and then they all took the test. He correlated with that data. Those first four correlated great. This one, he's like, yeah, there's no correlation. So, <laughs> seems to have the same problem. Okay. So, that's what I was doing. And that's why I made the assertions about, about how Sam wants to play uh, Madden. Is because down in this level, I was able to correlate with specific mechanics. And then I was able to say, okay, where are those mechanics? Where are those mechanics in games? And then make, make um, predictions about how people would love to play. And I think this is the first time it's been done. I hope so. 
Actually, I would love to meet someone else who's been doing this because this really isn't my area of expertise. <laughs> I, really, I would like to find, I'm looking for partners, which I'll get to at the end. Okay, but one of the most amazing things about this is this answers actually and presents, asks and then answers an incredible question that I have been struggling with, wanting to have an answer to, and this is this. The data that I have seems to suggest that we play games for the same reasons that we live our life. And that is a big deal, I think. <laughs> because I have had many conversations with people who are like, oh, no, no, games are all about trying to be someone other than who you are. My experience and my interviews have shown me that the person that you're trying to be who isn't like you is the you who you can't be in your real life, but who you do want to be. And games provide a venue, a vehicle, for you to go and be that person. Oh, man. <laughs> I am very excited about this. So, do your motivations in life determine your style of play? Yes, 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 and I don't know. Uh, so, how does this help? Why do we care? Here's a couple of, I'm going to wrap this up now, do, you, do my conclusion. First of all, um, it has changed my development life in the following way. Before, and if you're, working, um, uh, if you're working in games or you're making games, you've certainly had this conversation. Someone on your team will say, well, what players want is this. They want blah. They want achievements. They want to be challenged. They want social interaction. They want da 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 da, da. They want something. And before, I would, have to, I would say like, really, everyone? That seems like an oversimplification. And they would be like, ha ha, you have no proof. Fuck off, do it. I'm like, damn, I lost that topic again. Now, when people say players want this, I say this. I say, you know, you're right for half the population. The other half wants, because I know what the other half is. Because I've got these 30 spectrums in my head. <laughs> Fuck with me. I have charts and graphs. <laughs> right? <laughs> charts and graphs, baby. It's all about charts and graphs. So what is this? What is this goddamn thing? What do we do with this? Uh, it's a map. This is a map. This is a map. It's a map that can show us um, you can think of it um, in some ways. Uh, one, one thing we can do with this is we can turn it into kind of a personality test um, for video games, right? A game looks at the, at the Rorschach test. We can, but to do that, to do that, we have to take one extra step. We have to ask ourselves, what is the band of motivation that a given game will offer satisfaction for? This game has a lot of realism in it, and then maybe it's kind of pushing up to the middle. There's some stuff that's a little bit fantastic, right? So if your motivation is anywhere in that band, you'll probably like it in this, in this spectrum. Or maybe it's like this. Maybe it's very fantasy. This is maybe Skyrim is this way. Highly imaginative, but then it actually is pretty realistic in some ways. Lots, lots of stuff going on there. You can believe it, right? If we do that, if we take that step, then we can say, okay, let's take a random game. <laughs> uh, and let's map it out. Let's say, what, are the, what, what motivations does this game satisfy? And that's interesting. You can do that for other games, Call of Duty maybe. You can look at you know, uh, where, where games are hitting their satisfaction. How is that valuable? That's actually valuable in this situation where I'm looking at my game. I didn't make Halo Reach, by the way. That's just a picture. Uh, <laughs> I wish. Uh, I'm looking at my game, and I say, okay, it looks like my game right now, with my current design, I'm before alpha, right, or whatever, has these, but I'm missing these. I have no motivations. I'm not hitting these sorts of parts. It's a map to understand how my game design may or may not satisfy a wide group of people. But... Oh, that's, that's interesting and sort of analytical, but that's not really the stuff that I'm excited about. I want to talk about two ideas, um, uh, and then I'll close up. The first one is, it's clear to me, the, from, from the interviews that I've given, it's clear to me the following truth. The edges satisfy the middle. 
people with an average score in the center of these bell-shaped curves don't care. They don't buy games for those reasons. People seem to be buying games for the extreme scores that they have. So when I showed you this, it's actually this, <laughs> okay? The money is actually on the edges for each of these motivations. So it teaches us that the correct route to making our game broadly appealing <laughs> is to figure out what the hardcore wants on both sides, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is a little weird. Um, but if you think about an, a, a mechanic like achievements, we've nailed it. Achievements provide an achievement player endless hours of entertainment solving that problem, and they provide a contentment player the ability to say, fuck you. <laughs> not interested, <laughs> not going to spend my time doing it. Why? Because they're optional. And that's a game design decision that we all collectively made that seemed right, it was financially successful, it's gotten us where we are today. Okay, so that's cool. But for this, this is where I'm going with this. This is where I am pursuing this. I think this is a big deal. I think that the fact that we play because of the reasons we live, I think is a really, really big thing. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief look at what I'm doing next, where I'm going with this, um, what I want to explore, um, and then I'll wrap it up and be done. Um, I am working on a thing that I'm starting to call satisfaction theory. Satisfaction theory has come out of, the stu out of this study. This is what I have, this is what my interviews have been telling me, that people seem to have in their life unsatisfied motivations. And people who have those unsatisfied motivations <laughs> seem to be gamers. <laughs> okay? People who have all of their motivations satisfied in their real life see no reason to play. Here's what I mean. If this is my score, if my life is like I've got these ones taken care of, my life is, I've got lots of new shit going on, and I'm not, my life has a lot of randomness in it, and then, you know, these things, I take these things away, those are the reasons I'm playing, generally speaking. That's what I'm going to look for in a video game. Wouldn't it be interesting if we could figure out which, um, which satisfied, what the correlation is between unsatisfied human motivation in our lives, in our culture, in our world, and our tendency to buy specific games, and how they are connected. I think that that's really interesting. So it's a map. It's a map. I have a lot of questions I want to answer. Next step for me, there's stuff like this. Um, are there other correlations? Are there other mechanics? That are, um, that are connected. I don't know, I think there probably are. I've hit the ones that I, I was able to find so far. Um, are there differences in the scores between people who play a lot of games? Like if I just surveyed all of you guys and then did, had you mark casual or hardcore or whatever, would your scores be statistically different? I would love to know that. Are there specific motivations that are underserved in gaming? Right? In human, because if you imagine a culture where a single one of these motivations is simply not being addressed, you can imagine that the first person to release a game that satisfies that motivation well is going to get rich. <sighs> right? And maybe this is how we get these market movements. Wouldn't that be cool? Which ones are financial drivers? Are there specific ones of these? Um, Daniel yesterday shared a lot about, about um, which ones, the whales, the whales are up here, right? The whales are up here in completion, right? There's a concept of called organization uh, and set building. All of that stuff is up here. Um, and then where are the genres? Where do they fit? These are all interesting research questions. What I really am looking for, though, <laughs> is I'm looking for people who are willing to learn how to give this test. It's hard. It's complex. It's two hours of time, and you have to really be able to do that interview and understand the system deeply so that we can increase the database. I need more test subjects, <laughs> and to, do, get, to get more test subjects faster, I need people who can do this kind of survey. So if there's anyone like that in the audience, please contact Stephen. <laughs> if you guys are interested in helping and sort of pursuing this, this is what Stephen was talking about when he was saying about um, uh, research, research packages. I am desperately in need of some assistance on this. I'm collaborating with my sister. Again, she's been my, my, the academic other side. Um, but I, I am only one person. 
that's it. That's my whole talk. So thank you very much. Okay. So we're, I think we're five minutes over, so I think we'll do, and we'll have to do Q&A afterwards, but thanks all.